what is the output of MIA research and how is it being disseminated? The really important output of the research is of course that we do better implementation, that it makes a more meaningful, a more forceful and more compelling result on the ground. The other output of the research is that we publish and we share insights with the development community, with the research community, with anyone who is interested in our topics. In the last year alone, I think we have published something like 12 peer-reviewed articles. This has been a dream of mine for many, many years when I was still active as a professor to have the capacity research group that can publish as much in such journals. This is a considerable contribution to the domain of microinsurance and of bringing financial inclusion, financial literacy, uh, insurance education to grassroots level, to people who are innumerate uh, without experience with insurance, but they're totally accepting of insurance once they understand how it works, once the process has been adapted to their context, rather than expecting them to adapt to a classroom environment which is not relevant in the context. So I would say our research is not experimental, it is translational. We want to translate into the reality where we work, which is a challenging reality the outcomes of what we do. So all the knowledge needs to serve that purpose, and that's what we do. Please give an example of one of your proudest moments in terms of research success. Well, um, there are quite a lot of uh, moments. When I started around 2005, my work in India. The first total enigma was whether people are willing to pay anything at all. The issue of willingness to pay has been dealt in certain places in Africa, but not conclusively. From what we have seen, there was not very much literature at the time, but what we have seen at the time led us to believe that there is no gold standard as far as method. What do you check willingness to pay against? In which method? What is the way to do it? Would it be through questions? Would it be through some objective measures? Maybe a combination of the two. When we finished our first field uh, research, household surveys in several locations, and we extracted from that data information on willingness to pay. And we discovered, essentially, and published for the first time, that willingness to pay had two fundamental features. One, that the amounts paid were increasing as income increased, but the proportion of the willingness to pay decreased as income increased. That was an aha moment, very proud moment. And we have taken that insight, uh, not only to the community, which has checked it against those findings in other places and has come and corroborated it, but we have been able later on, a few years later, to model this relationship against various kinds of cost element, various kinds of objective data pieces, and identify that willingness to pay in fact behaves very similar to what we have seen under Engel's law, the profile which says that people spend on health a decreasing amount as their income increases, even if the absolute amount is increasing. If we can see that health insurance is a necessity good, 
and a willingness to pay for that necessity good follows the trajectory of Endo's law, we've got a totally new understanding than thinking of health insurance or of insurance in general as a luxury rather than as a necessity. So this is a very important piece of finding that cuts across several papers. In fact, at least I authored or co-authored three or four papers on that. And uh, that is a very important problem. I think that there is another very important problem moment that relates to understanding the demand. We have for years, for many years, been un living with theories of demand that have been developed in the West and have been proven in, with empiric evidence in the West. We have taken that to the field here and we have encountered many, many conflicting pieces of evidence that or other elements, other evidential elements that showed us that those theories are in fact violated, do not come true in the same way as they do in a Western society. So we needed to go back and really cut through the theoretical side, and we're still working on it. Some publication is out, but I'm sure there will be much more work to do on that, and that is another cutting edge uh, that helps understand totally differently how to design and offer insurance to the poor. Then there is the entire background insurance on what works. Does awareness work? Should we include it as part of the implementation? Or is it a waste of time and money? Do we actually need to have local data? Or can we assume that some generalities are good enough? Um, what is it amongst the choices that people prefer? Rare events or more frequent events? Very fundamental issues to the design and of course then also the pricing of packages. The combination of these things has allowed us to do the translational implementation which actually takes knowledge and translates it into a, you could say, an implementation model, a social model. Some people would say a business model. For us, it's a social model. These are the three main trajectories that I think are the proud moments of microinsurance, and they are very important, in my view, and they are, and will remain for many years still, work in progress. We have made huge strides, but there is much more to learn and the proof of the success will be in several ways. One, that the research community will recognize what we have done as applicable and relevant also in contexts which have totally different which are totally different. For instance, in disadvantaged circumstances in Western countries, in their cities and slums, etc. I think there is a great deal of relevance. Not everything is affluent and not everything is explained by what we see in the West. So that is one important element. And the other, of course, that in low-income countries, very many more people can be reached through the translational implementation that we have developed. And when we go to a bigger scale, bigger size, more people that have actually adopted it, the answer will be, accepted by everyone. Looking at the future, in which direction am I research is heading? Also, what new areas of research you would like to propose am I should be doing in the future? When we started, we worked on community-based health insurance. And microinsurance was associated mainly with health insurance. Now we are working on a composite vision of risks. People have a composite vision of risks in rural areas, and we need to respond to those. In some places, that means agricultural risk. But agricultural risk sounds very simple, but in reality is very, very detailed, very complicated. Each location, each season, and each crop 
need a different understanding. You cannot simply lump everything together. So there is a huge amount of effort that needs to go into understanding uh, the exposure, the risk exposure of the farmers so that the insurance solutions would actually be relevant, pertinent, useful. We're working on developing a model for climate cost of cultivation. It relates to many climatic parameters, but also to a number of agricultural parameters so that we can actually show what is the added cost of climate change, which needs to then find a suitable insurance solution. Another element is that when we compose multiple risks in one package, this is a new game. In insurance, the traditional way of doing insurance is that each insurer works in a separate silo. Life insurance does not do anything other than life. And those that deal with agricultural insurance do not do property casualty. Those that do livestock don't do agri. Households have one kitty. They don't have a minister of agriculture and a minister of health and competing budgets. They need to find a way to get a composite solution for a composite risk exposure. This is a new game. And our research team will have to bend its mind to find solutions how to actually put this both conceptually and then practically in the framework that is for the time being almost unexplored. So that is what the, I think the future looks like. People will remain in the center. It will remain community-based. It will remain demand-driven. It will remain contributory. It will remain focused on people who today are not approached and are not serviced by the insurance industry, by the commercial insurers. But beyond that, the quality of our analysis and the solutions we deliver should be such that longer term, the private sector would also be interested in what we're doing to deliver the underwriting where its strength is and where we cannot and would not want to compete, so that insurance is rolled out with underwriters, with good solutions, with suitable research and development, and that's our contribution to the future of insuring everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Tra. Thank you. Really, Dr. this just discussion was very insightful, educative, and interesting. And I can conclude that MIA is doing credible work, and you have a good, very good plans for the future. Wish you all success. Thank you very much indeed. That's very kind.